Hey guys, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to our Bible study with me series going through the book of Haggai. Today's video we're going to be in Haggai chapter 2 and this is actually the final chapter in this book as well because it's only two chapters long. If you haven't already, make sure you go back and watch the video I did on Haggai 1 first because we go a lot more into the context and really just set the scene for what's going on here. But a little refresher, so Haggai, like we talked about, is a minor prophet and God is speaking through Haggai to his people. And once again, the context here is that this is nearly 70 years after God's people were exiled to Babylon. Now the Babylonian Empire has collapsed. The world is being ruled by Persians and under the leadership of the high priest Joshua and the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, there is this group of exiles who have returned to Jerusalem to begin to rebuild the city and their lives. But because of political pressure and discouragement, the people halted their work. They essentially stopped doing what God had called them to do. And now through Haggai, God is calling them to return to this work. The Bible project breaks the book of Haggai into four main sections that sort of comprise the four main points of Haggai's message. And so to recap that, the first message is Haggai is accusing the people of misplaced priorities. So they've come back to Jerusalem, but instead of rebuilding the temple of the Lord, they are building their own fancy houses. And so that is chapter one. And then the second part of his message is he follows up a month later and addresses these shattered expectations among the people. So basically this new temple they're rebuilding, it doesn't compare to the former temple and its glory, and they're discouraged. And Haggai is giving them hope and encouragement by reminding them of the coming hope of God's future kingdom. And he is encouraging them to keep working even if their present circumstances feel discouraging. The next one is that he's gonna follow up a month later with this call to covenant faithfulness. This call to the people to humble themselves, to repent and to live God's way, because even as they're rebuilding this new thing, if they have not first purified their hearts before God, then that which they are touching and rebuilding is going to be impure. The final point of Haggai's message is giving them this future hope of God's coming kingdom and sort of presenting this question of will this generation be faithful to God and so experience the fulfillment of his promises and again as the Bible project puts it the book of Haggai sort of ends with this invitation to keep reading the next two and final two books of the Old Testament, Zechariah and Malachi, to find out. So the theme of the book of Haggai, as the Bible Project puts it, is that it presents this challenge to all generations that our choices matter and that the obedience of God's people is a part of how God works in the world. So God works through our obedience and knowing this should motivate our humility and our action. As for structure for chapter two, so Haggai chapter two has three main subheadings. The first one is the coming glory of the temple, which covers verses one through nine. The second subheading is blessings for a defiled people, and that covers verses 10 through 19. And then finally, it is Zerubbabel chosen as a signet, and that is verses 20 through 23. So for this video, we're gonna read through each subheading and then stop to talk through it and unpack it a little bit. And we'll do that for each of the three subheadings. And then as always, we'll pick a couple verses to zoom into and just study a little bit further. As always, any of the resources I reference, whether sermons, commentaries, my Bible, Bible highlighters, journals, any of that, that is all linked down below. So check that out if you have any questions. And without further ado, we'll just get into it. So if you have a Bible, turn to Haggai chapter two. First one, it says, in the seventh month on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people and say, 
Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst, fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. I, one thing noticed just in reading through that that I didn't even have in my notes is how many times it says the Lord of hosts. So I'm just gonna look that up really quick to see what that means. Okay, so I just looked it up. A good resource if you ever have questions about the Bible is called gotquestions.org. My friend Kirsten actually told me about this and the little subtitle just says Your Questions, Biblical Answers. So it's a great website to use for any questions. And I looked it up and it says that the word hosts is a translation of the Hebrew word seboath. Not sure if I said that right, but it means armies and it's a reference to the angelic armies of heaven. And so it's basically a way of saying God of the armies of heaven. And so this is the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of heaven. And we see that repeated a lot through this chapter. And I think it's really cool because here the people are discouraged and they're saying, we're rebuilding this, but God, it doesn't look anything like the temple before. And God is giving this promise that even if your circumstances look discouraging now, that I am going to fill this house with glory and its latter glory is gonna be even better than it was before. You can't see it now, but this story's not done and I am going to make this good. So God is encouraging them and, and as he's encouraging them, it's continually saying that he is the God of the armies of heaven. So he is powerful. He is far above it all. And what looks discouraging to them in their immediate circumstances right now, God is above it and he is powerful and he is going to make it something great. Now for the notes I actually did have prepared. The first thing I wanted to point out is where it says the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai, the prophet in verse one. And I pointed this out a couple times in the chapter one video, but there's this continual repetition, making sure we know that God is the one speaking, that even though the words are coming through Haggai by his hand, God is speaking. And so now God is going to tell Haggai to speak a second time. So remember that this message comes a month after the first message to rebuild the temple. And it's now a little follow up. And so he's saying in verse three, who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? So something I learned from the Enduring Word commentary is that Haggai spoke these words 66 years after the temple was destroyed. And so certainly there would have been some of the older men who had been around and who had seen Solomon's temple, the temple that existed before this, in all of its splendor. So they literally saw this great glorious temple and now they're seeing what is being rebuilt and how it doesn't compare. And Haggai says this, is it not as nothing in your eyes? So basically saying, look, I know it's not as good as before, but don't be discouraged because as God's gonna continue on through Haggai in verse five, God is saying, still continue to work even though you're discouraged because I am with you and my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. A note from my study Bible says that this transition moves the people from their past reflection. So like, yes, take a moment to think about what it was before, but we're now moving you into present action by means of a series of imperatives. As earlier, God's presence affirming to them, I am with you, which he also affirmed in chapter one, God's presence is going to form the basis 
for their ongoing work in the face of pessimism. And so it's gonna be hard. The circumstances aren't going to be easy, but they are going to be able to continue on in their work because God is with them. And then God goes on to say through Haggai in verse seven, I will fill this house with glory. And then not only that, but the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. So what's coming is even better than what you guys lost, even better than what was destroyed. And then he says, and in this place, I will give peace. What a beautiful and hope-filled promise that is. And in the midst of this promise, God is saying in verse seven, I will shake the nations so that the treasures of all the nations shall come in. And as I was reading through different commentaries, it talked about how this bringing in of treasures from all nations can refer to the Gentiles being grafted in. This is something I talked about in my Galatians Bible study video, how the Gentiles are being brought in and how salvation is not just for the Jews, but for the Jews and the Gentiles. And so these are the treasures that are being brought in, but that ultimately the treasure this passage speaks of is Jesus. It is pointing forward to him who is ultimately going to come. And then in verse eight, God says again through Haggai, the silver is mine, the gold is mine. A note from the Enduring Word commentary on this said that they didn't need to be discouraged if they didn't have the money for the building project that they had to boldly trust the God who owned every resource and then give generously. And a simple takeaway from this is that knowing God provides should make us more generous because all that we have is his anyway. Moving on now to the second subheading called blessings for a defiled people in verse 10. It says on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priests answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priests answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me declares the Lord and so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. So again, this section is gonna open by saying, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Again, Haggai speaking, but God's words. He is gonna speak a third time, a third message, and these have all been spaced out a month apart. And so this now, this new message is he's going into this question that he's asking the priests. And he's basically presenting these two scenarios saying, if somebody has holy meat, and that holy meat touches these other materials, will that holy meat make those other materials holy? And the priest said, no. And then Haggai says, okay, well, what about if this person is unclean because they've touched a dead body and then they touch these same materials, will those materials become unclean? And the priest said, yes. And so the point of this sort of question and answer scenario is to make a point and as the Enduring Word commentary put it, Haggai is questioning the priests 
who were accustomed to answering such questions about holiness and impurity because there had been all these different laws in the Mosaic law. And so according to that, the priests answered correctly. And the result is basically that holiness is not contagious. So if something holy touches something not holy, the holy isn't going to make the unholy holy, but impurity is contagious. So if something impure touches something that's clean, it is going to make that clean thing impure. And so that is the point here that Haggai is trying to illustrate that basically just being in the holy land in and of itself was not going to make the people holy, but they needed instead to humble themselves and to repent and to bring their lives into alignment with the way that God had called them to live. Because if they didn't, then they were unclean and even this new thing they were building, this new temple, it would be impure. So God says in verse 18, consider from this day onward, and then says from this day onward, I will bless you there at the end of verse 19. A note from the Enduring Word commentary says, God promised blessing to his people if they put their priorities back in order with him and his work first. Nevertheless, the blessings might not come immediately, and he did not want them to become discouraged, but to trust that from this day forward, as it says, God will bless them. Now for the final subheading in this chapter, Zerubbabel chosen as a signet, and this is verse 20. It says, the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. So this section starts by saying the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. So this is the same day that God spoke through Haggai the most recent time. So that last subheading, he is speaking through him a second time on that day. And what he is saying is speaking to Zerubbabel in verse 23 saying, I have chosen you. So I didn't really understand what was going on in this section, but I looked it up in the Enduring Word commentary and it said that Zerubbabel was truly chosen by God in the ancestry of Jesus. So Zerubbabel, the neat thing about him is that he was the last person to stand to be in both the line of Mary and of Joseph. Those are Jesus's parents, if you know the story of Jesus's birth. And so God used these two lines of ancestry for Jesus because if the Messiah was going to qualify for the throne of David, then he had to be in the legal line of David. So Zerubbabel came from the line of David and Jesus had to be in that legal line, which would have come through Joseph, even though he was not of his seed. And so the fact that Zerubbabel is both in the line of Mary and of Joseph is basically ensuring that Jesus, who is going to come through them, is in that legal line. And so basically this promise of saying, I have chosen you to Zerubbabel is ultimately pointing forward once again to Jesus. He is the true promise to come. That is all for Haggai chapter two. For further study, I wanna take a look at verses three through five, which talk about these people who had seen the temple in its former glory, but then the encouragement that God gives to them. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull out my scribe Bible journal as always, and we'll dig in. All right, so I wrote out those verses and you'll have to excuse, there's a lawnmower going on in our apartment complex right now. So hopefully that's not too distracting, but here's what it says. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? 
Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains in your midst, fear not. I think that's just so comforting. My spirit remains in your midst. It stays with you. I stay with you. Fear not. I want to look up a note from the Enduring Word commentary again. This one here says that these kinds of comparisons between the good old days and the present day, or between the work of God in various places and times, are rarely beneficial. It didn't do the people of Haggai's day any good to think of how magnificent Solomon's temple was compared to their own rebuilding work. I'm going to copy that down. Okay, so I copied that down, that the comparisons between the good old days and the present days or between works of God in different places and times are rarely beneficial. And then it didn't do the people of Haggai's day any good to think of how magnificent Solomon's temple was compared to their own rebuilding. Now, like we talked about earlier in the study, there was an appropriate space for reflecting on what the temple had been, but not to the point of detracting from current work. So there was an appropriate space for reflecting on the past, but the call was to not be dwelling on that so much that it stopped them from taking action in the present. And so the call here is to not get so stuck on what things were that we are not obedient to what God is currently doing. And so the issue isn't necessarily one of reflection, but one of comparison. Okay, so I just wrote that there is an appropriate space for reflecting on the past, but it shouldn't detract us from God's current work. There's one more note I want to read from the commentary. It's actually a quote from Charles Spurgeon, and it's a little long, but I think it's worth reading. It says, The smallness of our gifts may be a temptation to us. We are consciously so weak and so insignificant compared with the great God and his great cause that we are discouraged and think it vain to attempt anything. The enemy contrasts our work with that of others and with that of those who have gone before us. We are doing so little as compared with other people, therefore let us give up. That's what we tell ourselves. We cannot build like Solomon, therefore let us not build at all. Yet brethren, there is a falsehood in all this, for in truth nothing is worthy of God. The great works of others and even the amazing productions of Solomon all fell short of his glory. And so essentially it's saying how sometimes there is a temptation not to want to work because we compare our works to other people's and we just think that it could never measure up. But it's saying in reality, even the best of other people's still fall short of the glory of God. We all do. And so we don't need to compete with anybody, but rather offer our complete best to God. So I wrote that down. We don't need to compete with anyone, but simply offer our complete best to God. And again, this is an issue of the heart. Are we willing to give all of ourselves, all of our hearts, all of our obedience wholly to God? Okay, so I put, are we willing to give all of ourselves, all of our hearts, all of our obedience, all of our work wholly to God, and then trusting him with the results. That is all for Haggai chapter two and for the book of Haggai. Let me know in a comment down below any takeaways or verses that stood out to you. I hope that you enjoyed this study. If you did, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and then also hit the subscribe button if you haven't already and share this with a friend who might like to go through it as well. And then also give me some ideas down in the comments of what book you would like to see me do next as far as Bible study series go. Again, that's gonna be after the wedding, so it'll be a little bit of a wait, but I'm excited to dig into a new book soon. Thank you so much for watching this study and I will see you in my next video. Bye.